Hi, my name is Peter Michael Bauer, and I'm the director of Rewild Portland. We're a 501c3 nonprofit, and our mission is to promote cultural, environmental resilience through the education of earth-based arts, traditions, and technologies. That mission comes to life in the form of educational workshops, community building, and ecological restoration. We are super excited to be participating in the online archaeology roadshow this year. Archaeology is super important to the work that we do here at Rewild Portland. We don't see archaeology as just about studying the past, but rather an embodied science that is about looking at the past to understand humanity's place in the present so that we can make a path forward into the future. Today, there's a lot of challenges facing humanity across the globe. And if we are able to understand how other cultures of humans in the past were able to live successfully for a very long period of time, we can use that knowledge to transform our society today to one that can live uh, in the long term in the future. One of the ways that we incorporate that idea into our work at Rewild Portland is by teaching ancestral skills. Teaching ancestral skills really gives us the ability for people to feel the humanness in their body and in their existence. By using our hands to create things from natural materials, we really not only connect to our place, but also to the past and what makes us human. One of the exciting things about archaeology to us is basically how it can connect people across cultures all around the world. If you go far back enough, all of the technology is essentially the same kinds of techniques. So we have a shared experience of what it means to be a human culturally. However, one of the beautiful things about that is that in each different region, while the techniques are similar across the world, in each different region, you have um, a unique flourishing of the particular materials and the particular people and their stories and cultural customs in that place. So while we may share, for example, making uh, bone tools in specific ways across the world, each of those bone tools might be done with different animals in a different style, um, you know, with different types of engravings and things like that that sort of ex show the expression of humanity's uniqueness in particular places. The difference between ancestral skills and survival skills is context. In a survival situation, you've been removed from your society and placed into an unfamiliar environment. Whereas in an ancestral skills setting, you're in a culture that's been thriving in a particular place for hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of years. You know where your food is, you know where your water is, you know where your shelter is, and you know how to get them, you know how to access them readily and easily. Whereas in a survival situation, that is not the case. You've been removed from that context. You no longer know where and how to get the things that you need. Often people conflate those because they think our ancestors were living in a constant state of survival, but they weren't. Because ancestral skills are generally things you can make with your own hands from objects found in nature, you can use them in a survival context. For example, I could create a bow drill in a survival situation if I needed to, but that makes the bow drill both an ancestral technology and a survival skill. In the sense that most of us have matches or a lighter somewhere in a drawer in our house at all times. In the same way our ancestors or people today who live in non-industrial societies have those kinds of tools readily available should they need them. Everything that you see here on our table is stuff that our instructors have made and that we teach how to make in our classes. The only one of the objects on the table that is an actual artifact is this one here. And this is an Acheulean hand axe. It's a surface find from Africa. Unfortunately, we don't know when or where this was found. However, it was sent to us by an archeologist in order to teach people about why you shouldn't pick up artifacts that you find lying around. If you do see an artifact lying around, you should contact the local tribal archeologist for whatever area that you're in and let them know when and where you found an object and just leave it there. Another cool tool on our table here, or uh, rather another way of looking at contemporary ideas around ancestral skills is that they're not just ancestral, they're actually embodied and experienced and live today. And one of those examples is this tool here, which is a blade. And most people think this might be obsidian or something, but it's actually made out of a 1970s television screen. So, um, you know, people are always fascinated to look at it and pick it up and examine it. But I always say, be mindful of your screen time. Bow drill is a great example of a skill that is both an ancestral technology and a survival skill in that friction fire is a form of an ancestral technology that was available to people whenever they needed it. Uh, and it's also a survival skill because it's something that you can make from scratch if you can't produce fire 
um, on your own. So one of the other cool things about bow drill is that it requires multiple moving parts or multiple mediums, not just wood. Uh, whereas, you know, a hand drill is like a long spindle drilling into, into another board. With a bow drill, you have a bow. And this bow here is an example of using different mediums to create the friction fire. Uh, and this is a bow made out of a rib bone and the string is made out of animal hide. So this is a combination of using stone tools to work the wood and then bone and, and hide to spin the wood in order to produce a coal. So you're using all these different mediums to create fire. It's not just rubbing two sticks together, right? There's all these other pieces of technology that come into play here, which is interesting because they, think, they call it the stone age, but really, um, for example, in order to make some of these stone tools, you actually need antler or bone, something softer to, uh, to nap them with, to pressure flake. And in order to do that, you have to have this other medium. So is this a stone tool or is it a, the combination of stone and bone? Uh, philosophical idea of what is technology and how do different technologies coalesce or come together to create something. They, they call it the Stone Age simply because that's all that remains in the archaeological record. You know, a lot of the fiber, perishable material culture perishes. So we don't have a Bone Age or a Wood Age. Um, and that's just simply because we don't know what people were using at the same time in collaboration with all these other mediums that we see beyond stone. So now that you know a little bit more about Rewild Portland and ancestral technology in general, let's go ahead and take a closer look at the bow drill. The bow drill is a friction fire technique. Friction fire just means rubbing two pieces of wood together, creating that friction and generating enough heat and dust to create a ember, a glowing ember, which then you can use to blow in a, a dry material into a flame and then you have fire. So the bow drill is just one version of hundreds of different methods of friction fire that we found all around the world. It's one of those versions that we see in a lot of places. So it's kind of cross-cultural in that way. It's also um, one of the relatively easier ones to do. So we see this a lot in survival skills and ancestral skills programs. People are teaching the bow drill. It gets its name from the bow. So the bow is not like a bow and arrow, which, which is really tight. The bow is more like, um, it's a little loose like this, right? So you've got your bow and your cord, and it's loose because you take the spindle, which is your drill, your drill bit, and you wrap it in there and you want it to be tight. But you have to have a little bit of looseness in there in order to get it in there and get it be tight. You want it so tight that if you let go, it'll flip out like that. And what that does is that wrapping, that tight wrapping creates tension around the spindle so that as I turn it, or rather as I push the bow, it's tight enough to actually spin the spindle. In order to hold this in place, you need another part, which is called the handhold. So the handhold goes in the top to help hold it stable. And the handhold could be made of all kinds of things. Here we've got an astragalus bone. This is uh, an elk ankle bone, essentially. And uh, it's naturally got this little curve in it and a little spot right there that fits the spindle perfectly that you can see those char marks that's from drilling using this a whole bunch and i didn't have to modify this bone at all this is just the way it's shaped so it's really easy to pick up a bone like this and already you've got a tool for this purpose and then of course the fire board so this is what we're drilling into with our drill here and this notch is meant to collect all the dust so as the spindle is grinding down into the board that friction is creating wood dust because the matter has to go somewhere and it gets ground down into a fine dust. Now the friction is also generating heat. So when we cut this groove in here, what we're doing is funneling all of that powder, all of the dust that's being created by the friction, as well as all the heat that's being generated by that friction. Eventually it gets hot enough that shoots a spark into that dust pile and that spark will then ignite the dust and then we'll have a glowing ember. So those are the five parts of the bow drill, bow, string, spindle, fireboard, and handhold. However, there's a really important piece that most people don't really include in that, which is tinder. And it's like I say, you have to have a, uh, you know, a bird doesn't lay an egg until it builds its nest. So we don't want to lay a fire egg until we have that fire nest. So what we do first is create a fire nest. And that's basically just taking any kind of dry fiber and scoring it up into um, you know, like a nest, like a bird's nest. Western red cedar bark is a really great material to use for that. You can see here's the outer bark, here's the inner bark. Um, you can pull it apart, crinkle it up with your hands. You could use a rock and shave it. Um, and it's really fluffy and great. 
Today, instead, I'm going to be using jute twine, which is another natural fiber that you can just get from a, a regular store. In the meantime, I'm going to just make sure that I keep my tinder dry. So once I find tinder and I make the tinder bundle, I make sure that I put it in a place that's going to keep it nice and dry, uh, which is usually in a pocket of mine. So then the next thing, once I've got the parts all worked out, I need to make sure that my posture is good. And I want to hold my wrist as close to the spindle as I can. I'm not going to be out here. See if I were to have my hand out here, it'd be wobbling around. I'm going to brace my arm around my shin like so. And this is basically glued in place against my body. I'm going to gather up any extra cord back here. I'm going to hold the very back of the bow and I'm even going to put my thumb on the cord here. And then I'm going to use the whole length of the bow. I'm not doing these little movements here. I want to use that whole length. And you could start to see the dust filling up in the little notch that I carved there. And that's how I know this is working. And, oh. Now I know I've got a coal in there. You can see it's smoking like that. And on a windy day like today, I might protect it. On a less windy day, I might fan it to give it oxygen. And what I'm gonna do is make a little pocket and I can just tap that and it goes right in. And now what I'm gonna do is just kind of fan this back and forth a bit. So I'm drying this out as much as I can as I, as I move my hand back and forth. And what's gonna happen is I can feel this is getting hotter. It's drying out all the fiber as it sits there. And I'm priming the tinder bundle to ignite into a flame when I blow on it. So that now I feel that it's warm and it's hot and dry. When I blow on it, it's gonna catch on into a flame. Like so, there's our fire. Our flame rather. So that's how you do the bow drill fire by friction technique. Thanks for watching. Hopefully next year we'll be back in person and you can give this a try yourself. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the archeology span roadshow.